Father, Scripture reminds us that the unfolding of your words gives light, gives understanding. We don't want this to be just a mere human effort of turning the pages. We want your spirit to open the eyes of our understanding as we look at your word. Not only are we utterly dependent upon your spirit to help us understand the meaning of the text, but also we acknowledge our dependence upon him in terms of how it applies in our individual lives. So I pray, Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, you would help us to have the kind of attitude that God looks on with favor, the heart that is humble, contrite and submissive and trembles at your word. Would you do that work in our hearts, please? For your name's sake, we ask. Amen. Please open your Bibles to Exodus 35. Today, we're going to be concluding our survey through the book of Exodus. We're going to actually be surveying chapters 35 to 40, six chapters. It's page 128 in the church Bibles here. Of the vast majority of this section, once again, uh, gives details of the construction of the tabernacle and how God empowered certain individuals to build the tabernacle. We've seen these details in chapters 25 through 31, but they repeat it again, which tells us that there's a significance when God doesn't waste words. If he repeats something, there's a reason for it. Earlier in the chapters, he gave the description how it should be built. Now, once again, it's a reminder when the construction time uh, came to be. Uh, this is then the climax of the book of Exodus. What started in Exodus 1 with the people in slavery, the climax reaches in chapter 40, verses 34 through 38, where we will see the tabernacle being completed and God's glory coming to fill the tabernacle, symbolizing his presence among his people. That was God's purpose, to redeem Israel from slavery in Egypt, to dwell in their midst. If you notice, a lot of the songs were focused on the presence of God. This was the whole point of God redeeming his people, bringing them to Mount Sinai. And in Exodus 29, verse 45, God promised Moses, I will be your God, I will dwell in your midst. And that promise comes to fulfillment today. Despite the setback of the golden calf incident, God graciously renewed his commitment to be with his people as a result of Moses' intercession and the people's repentance. As we explore these chapters, I want you to see two main themes, two main themes. That's what we're going to be looking at today. God empowering his people to build according to his specifications, the tabernacles. One thing for God to say, this is how it should be made. But then he didn't stop there. He ensured it would be made that way by empowering, gifting certain individuals for the construction project. But also, we're going to see God's desire to dwell with those who commit themselves to obedience. As these people obeyed, God honored their obedience by coming to dwell with them. Remember, the golden calf was a result of their disobedience. That's why he withdrew his presence, withdrew his commitment to be present with them. When they repented, God renewed the commitment, comes back and restores them. So that's why the title of this morning's message, as you would see on the screen there too, is we're worshiping the God who empowers and dwells with the obedient. He empowers and dwells with the obedient. In chapter 35, notice verses 1 through 3. Once again, the unit starts with the reminder of the Sabbath. As God renewed the covenant with Moses and the construction of the tabernacle was to be started, in the first three verses of chapter 35, God once again reminded the people of the importance of keeping the Sabbath. Look at verses. Uh, look at verse 2. For six days... Work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a day of Sabbath rest to the Lord, to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on it is to be put to death. That's how serious God was for the people living under the old covenant, the importance of the Sabbath. It's a holy day. It would mark his people as distinct people, as holy people, worshiping a holy God. And then in chapter 
35 verses 4 through 29. Moses, things that we covered earlier, Moses invites the people to bring voluntary offerings of the materials in the tabernacle. Look at verse Verse 4, Moses said to the whole Israelite community, this is what the Lord has commanded. From what you have, take an offering for the Lord. Everyone who is willing to bring to the Lord an offering of gold, silver, etc., etc., they were to bring those offerings voluntarily from what they had. The response of the people was very positive. If you quickly come down to verse 21, we see everyone who was willing and whose heart moved them came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting for all its service and for the sacred garments. Not only offerings, but God also invited the people whom he had empowered to come and labor. Verse 10, all who are skilled among you are to come and make everything Yahweh has commanded. In other words, everybody was encouraged to play their part in building the tabernacle. And then in verses 30 to verse 7 of chapter 36, we read how God appointed certain individuals. Bezalel is a man who is going to be leading the whole project. And he has an assistant that God empowered, a man by the name of Haliab, and others too gifted by God to help them with this project. Verses 30 and 31 describes how God gifted Bezalel to lead the project by filling him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. God empowered Bezalel to be a leader. And then verses 34 and 35 describe how God also gifted Ohaliab, along with Bezalel, the ability to teach others. Ability to teach others, and how God also empowered others with various skills to work as engravers, designers, and weavers. So you can see God empowering people to build the tabernacle according to the specifications he himself outlined. Then in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 36, we read Moses calling these two men and others to start the project. Verse 2, then Moses summoned Bezalel and Ohaliab and every skilled person to whom the Lord had given ability. That's important. And to whom the Lord has given ability and then notice, and who was willing to come? That's human side of it. We cannot say God has gifted me and sit lazily. We have to do our part. Use those gifts. And who was willing to come and do the work. They received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. I mean, th these people are so generous. So the as they brought the gifts, and now those who are involved in the building project come and tell Moses, you got to stop them from bringing this. Notice verses 6 and 7, what Moses did. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because they already had, what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. Folks, here's where we see what happens when the Holy Spirit moves, don't we? Love for money and possessions is replaced by willing generosity. I'm thinking Acts chapter 2, Holy Spirit comes. And what happens? The people were generous in sharing their possessions. Acts chapter 4, same thing. You find people selling their properties to help the poor. We sometimes are so hesitant to touch our savings to help the needy. Think about that. Where the Spirit of God works, stinginess is replaced by willing generosity. Spirit of God does work. So all the materials are now available. Next we read this lengthy portion from chapter 36 verse 8 and all the way to chapter 39, middle part of it. The materials were to be used to build the items. Now we've gone through this in three messages in chapter from chapters 25 through 31. So I'm not going to go through the text, but what I'm going to do that will hopefully help you is 
use the pictures we've seen before of the tabernacle and the various elements to kind of reinforce your understanding. So when we move into Leviticus, you'll have a better idea. Okay, this is how the sacrifices were done. They would bring, they would kill the sacrifice here. They would wash their hands. They would go take the blood inside. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start out by looking at the overall layout of the tabernacle, which we've seen a few times there. Notice the entire tabernacle was divided into three compartments. On the left, you will see that's that most holy place. Only one item was there, a box, basically, the Ark of the Covenant. And then the second section is called the holy place. Three items are there. And then outside, which is called the courtyard, you have basically two items. There's a curtain dividing the most holy place from the holy place. And then there's another screen that divides or a curtain that divides the holy place from the courtyard. So that's kind of the overall layout. The first thing that Moses describes here in this long unit is the Ark of the Covenant. That's the box I said that's inside. Basically, this was a wooden box covered by gold with poles also covered by gold. Three items you can see were to be inside the box. One is the two tablets that Moses received again from God of God's law and then Aaron's rod the staff and then the manna, the sample of the manna to show that God is a sustainer of life. He provided for the people. On the top is the most important item. It's called the atonement cover or the mercy seat. That's where sacrificial blood of the animal sacrificed on the day of atonement. Once a year, the high priest would take and sprinkle it on top. What's the significance you ask? Here's a holy God from heaven coming to dwell amongst his people but he sees the broken law inside. So his wrath has to be appeased when he sees the blood. His wrath is satisfied so he can come and dwell with his people. Only the high priest could go inside the most holy place where this Ark of the Covenant was kept to cherubim on top, bowing down, again, symbolic of worship, giving honor to God. Next you see this Screen, the most holy place, dividing from the holy place. Here's a screen. The specifications are given in the text, and there's the cherubim there. It's, it's a nice embroidery. Again, we saw people were skilled in this. So they came and they did that. And then when you move to the next part of it, which is the holy place, there's three items. The first thing, right at the entrance, is this altar of incense where incense, according to God's specifications, were to be made, and incense morning and evening. There had to be incense going, so there's always a fragrance. It, sim it symbolizes God's presence, and he's pleased with them. They had to follow, and that incense was not to be used for any other purpose, only for that specific purpose. And then there's two other items there. One is the table, 12 loaves of bread, symbolizing 12 tribes of Israel were to be kept, and the idea there is God is the one who sustains physical life. Like Jesus said, I am the bread that gives life. So symbolic of that. And then there's another item that would be kept there, which is what we call as the lampstand. You have the lampstand, lights were to be lit. Again, symbolic of Jesus being the light of the world. The light was to help the priests work in the tent, do their daily activities. Once again, let's look at the layout of the tabernacle. So you see what's in the most holy place, what's in the holy place, and then outside courtyard, two specific items to draw your attention to. Yes, you have a screen there, and then outside where you have two items. Number one, which is kind of important. But before we do that, I, I want to also point out the next slide would show you this most holy place and the holy place were to be covered. There was four coverings. You can see the different four coverings. First was a linen covering, then one made of goat's hair, and one made of ram skin dyed red, and the badger skin, that's the final one. That's like a leather covering to protect it. So you can see it would be dark inside. So that, that's where the light comes in to shed light for the priest to work. Here's another view that gives you a little cross-sectional view there. That's the, ins the left, starting from the left, you have the most holy place, you have the curtain there, you can see the cherubim, and then the outside curtain, there's no cherubim. The cherubim was only to divide the most holy place from the holy place. Then you have the different items there, 
Ark of the Covenant inside and outside. There you have the three items. You can see the altar of incense right outside the curtain. And then you have the lampstand and the table with the 12 loaves. Once again, the layout. So we're going to see, uh, go to the next screen, please. We're seeing the most holy place and the holy place. Now, let's quickly look at the last two items there. You have this bronze basin. The idea of the basin was when the priests, before they enter into the holy place, they would have to wash their hands. The idea, again, is ceremonially clean because we're entering the presence of a holy God. And as the next screen would show you the altar of burnt offering. What is interesting is this is the first thing the first thing as they enter the tent that's placed, what's the idea? Sacrifice. Without sacrifice, you dare not step into the presence of a holy God. That's the altar of burnt offering with all those horns again. It's symbolic of sacrifice is the way through which sinners can be in the presence of a holy God. Now we've seen all this seen all this. Once again, to give you an idea, I want to make sure that when you read Exodus 25 through 40, that you don't shy away from that. You get a full understanding as you work through this. God has given nearly 15, 16 chapters for a reason. He dedicated only two chapters for the creation of the universe. You think about it. Only two chapters, Genesis 1 and 2. But so many chapters given for this. And Sadly, we tend to overlook these things. But I hope we would read them with a fresh appreciation. So, next screen. Uh, so again, you see the whole layout there. Most holy place, the holy place, and what's in there. And the next screen will show you the outside fence also. So you can see the fence and you can see the entrance there. This would be in the middle of the camp. All the tribes will be surrounding it. When we get to the book of Numbers, we're going to see more about that. The idea is God dwelling in the midst of his people. In the midst. He takes the center stage, and rightfully so. He must always take the center stage. So that's kind of the idea there. And then the priests who were to minister, they had to be clothed a certain way. A certain way. Not just, they could just walk in any way. Every piece of the clothing had a reference the holiness, to the holiness. I'm not going to go through all of that. There's, there's the high priest carrying the 12 tribes before the presence of God, always interceding. Jesus, the high priest, always intercedes. Leaders of the church are constantly reminded of this to intercede for their people. That's why the Bible emphasizes so much, Acts 6, 4. The apostle says, we must give our attention. We must div continually devote ourselves to prayer and ministry of the word. Prayer is first. If you are not prevailing with God in prayer, you cannot prevail with people through the word. That's kind of the idea. Prayer first. Speak to God first before we speak to people. So, you see, everything is done. The construction is done. The people would go and minister there. The clothing they follow everything. And then chapter 39, verses 42 to, sorry, verses 32 to 43. Work is done. Now, Moses inspecting it. That's what we read. Is it done according to God's prescription? Because it's very important. He sees it. It's done according to God's prescription. And he blessed the people. Look at verse 32. So all the work on the tabernacle the tent of meeting was completed. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. In verse 43, Moses inspected the work and saw that they had done it just as the Lord had commanded. So Moses blessed them. Some think Moses blessing the people is an echo of Genesis 2, 3, when God saw creation and he blessed them. This is kind of a new stage in redemptive history. So Moses is blessing it. And then chapter 40, verses 1 through 33, the tabernacle is now erected. Follow along as I read a few verses. It, we see the tabernacle being consecrated. Mo, Aaron and his uh, sons are consecrated to function as priests. Look at verse 1. Then Yahweh said to Moses, set up the tabernacle 
the tent of meeting on the first day of the first month. Verse 9, take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it, consecrate it and all its furnishings, and it will be holy. Verse 12, bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then dress Aaron in the sacred garments, anoint him and consecrate him so he may serve me as priest. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics. Verse 15, anoint them just as you anointed their father so they may serve me as priests. Verse 17, so the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year, exactly one year since they left Egypt. It's been nine months since they reached Mount Sinai. One year. And it's fitting. It's fitting. One year. Start of a new life in there. In Israel's history now. God dwelling in their midst. It marks a new beginning. In Israel's history. And the unit ends with these words in verse 33. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle. And altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard, and so Moses finished the work. What a faithful servant of the Lord was Moses. Foreshadowing the ultimate and perfect servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ, who on the night of his betrayal said these words as he prayed to his father, having accomplished the greatest work on earth, our redemption. In John 17, verse 4, Jesus said, I have brought you glory on earth, by finishing the work you gave me to do. By finishing the work you gave me to do. So the tabernacle was erected. And then comes the climax. The whole purpose for which God redeemed his people and for which God had them erect the tabernacle for him to come and dwell in the midst of his people in all his glory. Look at verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Yahweh filled the temple signifying God's presence among his people. This event is significant for at least two reasons. God's glory so evident. Number one, God was pleased with the faithful construction of the tabernacle by Moses and others whom he had empowered, by the way. But they were also willing and obedient. Secondly, by him coming this way, he's telling the people, I'm not going to be far away from you. I'm going to be in your midst. There's a lot of challenges for you. Yes. You'll be going through a lot of storms, as David prayed earlier. But guess what? I'm going to be there with you. You might think I'm absent, but I'm still there in that boat. I'm there. The God of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm there in your midst. God who empowered his people came to dwell with them. And according to verse 35, this manifestation of God was so intense that even Moses, with whom God spoke face to face, with whom God met the top of Mount Sinai, couldn't meet him. Mount Sinai, top of Mount Sinai, is now brought down into the camp. That's the idea. It's not just one man. It's the whole congregation can experience his Presence. Yes, Moses would always experience his presence in a more intimate way, but now, as this glory filling, later there's the same glory that would fill the temple when Solomon completes the construction. It's so intense. And Moses could not go in there. Verse 35, Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And the book ends with these final words. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of Yahweh was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night. Not little fire, that's the Shekinah glory there in the sight of all the Israelites during their travel. Imagine someone sleeping in a tent. They're afraid. Anxiety grips them at night because night is the time the enemy attacks more. Especially when you cannot sleep. So what would they do? Just open the tent curtain a little bit. Look at the cloud. You're there. You're there. During the day, when they're concerned, look up. You're there. They had to walk around the tabernacle. He is there in our midst. He is there in our midst. Glorious ending 
Exodus, showing God's faithfulness in not just redeeming his people out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, but also guiding them up to Mount Sinai thus far and dwelling in their midst. Not only that, he would continue to protect and lead them into the promised land. But here's the thing, as exciting as this book has been in the sense of God redeeming his people, dwelling with them, a significant barrier still remained God, between God and his people. What is the barrier? God's people were still limited in experiencing his presence. Couldn't go into the most holy place anytime you wanted, could you? You couldn't. Even Moses, as close as he was to God, was still limited in experiencing God's presence. And this limitation, this barrier of sin, would only be removed years later, or in our case, 2,000 years ago, by the once for all perfect sacrifice through the death, the perfect death of the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself. The writer of Hebrews tells us this in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, that we have confidence to enter the most holy place. That's the actual presence of God himself. Most holy place. How? By the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way opened for us through the curtain. That curtain that separated. That's why when Jesus died, the curtain was ripped from top to bottom. God ripped the curtain saying, now sinners can come into my presence through the body of my son that was given for them to the blood of my son that was shed for them. Not only that, but as a result of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, believers are not only saved from eternal destruction, but we also receive the Holy Spirit at the time of our conversion who dwells within us individually, something that the Old Testament believers did not experience to the fullest extent that you and I experience. Individually and collectively as a church, we don't have the cloud anymore to guide us. But we have a better guide, the best guide. The Holy Spirit himself, God himself, we have him. And what does he do? Guide us, strengthen us, comfort us until we reach that promised land. The writer of Hebrews called the promised land as the heavenly home, heavenly country, so to speak, where we will fully experience the presence of God. Last week we saw we will see God face to face. He'll wipe away all our tears. Everything, this sin-cursed world we live, that this physical body that is so broken will be made whole. Most importantly, we'll worship God without the interference of sin. We cannot even comprehend what that means because we are so affected, so marred by sin, so deep inside. Redeemed we are, but still, that old nature, sinful flesh, constantly needs to be put to death. So the light of these blessings, the blessings of Jesus' death, the blessing of the Holy Spirit indwelling individually and collectively, what must be our response? One response. Always being grateful to God. Always being grateful to God. But it's easy to talk about gratitude. Yeah, we should be thankful. How do we express it? How do we express our gratitude? I want to point out in two specific ways that's connected to these chapters. Two specific ways in which we express our gratitude to God. Number one, by living a holy life. These people are obedient. That's why God would come and dwell with them, living a holy life. Secondly, by faithfully using our spiritual gifts to serve the church, the place where God now dwells with his people. The tabernacle would be replaced by the temple, and then replaced by the church in this current dispensation of God. Let's look at the first one. We express our gratitude to God, first of all, by living a holy life. First Peter 2, first part of verse 9, describes followers of Jesus in this manner, similar to how God described his people Israel after he brought them out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 19. But you, talking to believers, followers of Jesus, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Being described as a holy nation should compel us to live a holy life. Especially that we have received a greater blessing than what Israel received since we live post-cross. 
We've received not just physical deliverance from a place. We've received spiritual deliverance from that place called hell. And not only that, we experience the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit at all times. That's why we need to also remember, just as Israel's sin with the golden calf led to judgment and threatened God's presence in their midst, our sin as believers in Jesus Christ will also lead to severe disciplining from God and a loss of joy of experiencing God's presence in our midst. Show me a person who's deep in discouragement. They're not walking close with the Lord. Show me a person at the same time, even though they're suffering tremendously, but there is that joy. It's because they're walking in submission to the Holy Spirit. He is the one, according to Galatians 5, fruit produced by the Spirit. One of the characteristics is what? Joy. Joy. Even when things fall apart, the Holy Spirit produces joy because we're walking in submission to we're walking in holiness. That is why we must always be motivated to pursue a life of holiness, to reflect holiness in our thoughts. That's where it starts. And in our words and in our actions. That's the first way we express gratitude for the blessings we have through Jesus. Secondly, we express our gratitude to God by faithfully using our spiritual gifts to serve the church, which is the place where God now currently dwells. The New Testament describes in more than one passage believers collectively as described as God's temple, the temple of God. Let me read quickly three, not fully, but you have them laid out there in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, believers collectively are described as what God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in our midst. Your, that's plural there, your midst. Ephesians 2, verses 21 through 20, 20, 20, 21 to 22, Paul describes the church as a building joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. It's a dwelling place again where God lives by his spirit. Same Peter in chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5, he likens Christians as living stones forming a spiritual house, a holy, priest, a holy priesthood offering sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we're described as a temple, we're described as a building, we're described as, a, as stones put together. We're described in all these ways. Not only that, because we are a temple, because we are a building, God has also gifted every single born-again believer with gifts to serve the church. First Peter 4, verses 10 and 11 Peter says, each of you has received a gift, more than one gift usually. Each, each believer. If you're sitting here as a born again believer, a child of God, you have been given gifts by the Holy Spirit. You've been gifted, you've been empowered. But there's a reason. To use whatever gift we've received to serve others. Verse 11 talks about serving one another. That's within the body of Christ one another, so that God would be praised. Jesus Christ be lifted up. Through Christ, Ephesians 3, Paul finishes his doxology in chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, verse 20 and 21. He talks about, now to God be the glory in the church through Jesus Christ. So the church plays a very important part in the believer's life. Very important part. The church Acts 20 verse 28 is described as that which is bought by the blood of Jesus. That's not a small price. That's a heavy price. And the church can bring glory to God only when each believer fully realizes, I have a gift and he's given me a gift not to bury it. You know what happened to the guy that buried that one talent? He was not a believer. He showed he was not a believer because he was not faithfully exercising the gift. We can claim to be Christians all day long, born again, believers, baptized, this and that, but if we are not actively serving the local church where God has placed us, guess what, folks? We have to really ask ourselves, am I really saved or am I deceiving myself into thinking I'm saved 
or two? Am I suppressing the Holy Spirit and living for myself and not for what God has gifted me for? The Israelites joyfully and willingly gave of their time, talent, and treasures when it came to building the tabernacle. How much more should we, who are bought by the blood of Christ individually and collectively as a temple, be moved to strengthen and serve the church without grumbling, without complaining, the current place where God dwells by his spirit. I hope Exodus, as we conclude, reminds us once again to be resolved to pursue a holy life so we can experience the presence of God in our midst. And second, it would move us to serve the church. Does the church have problems? Yes, sinners living together, there will always be problems. But we put our ego aside. We humble ourselves and we say, yes, I will do what I can with the strength God has given me. Not in competition with others. That is sinful. Whatever task that needs to be done, I want to do it. Not just the task here. Serve faithfully for the smile of the one and only one. The one who hung on that cross between heaven and earth. For my sin. That should be the motivating factor. We serve with the true heart of a servant. We say, I'd like to be called a servant, but what do we do when we're actually treated as a servant? That's the key question. Egos. No one notices. That's what drives us often. Or other priorities crowd out. Let us give a commitment to the Lord. It takes commitment. Let us be a blessing to others. Because Jesus Christ deserves it. It's for him we do. It's for him. God is not asking us to do anything that's beyond our means. What we have. Sometimes people say, I have physical ailment. I'm constantly in bed. Pray. Pray diligently. What a beautiful ministry that is. The church needs, what the church needs the most, they can tell you is this, prayers of the people. Prayers of the And for those of you who are still distant from God, please understand, if you continue to remain distant, you will forever be away from his comforting presence when you leave this earth. We don't know what the next moment holds, next day holds. I mean, think of Wayne as an example. Who ever thought, last Sunday when we met here, did we even think that this would be the situation? This is a vivid reminder how quickly things can change, which means you can die any moment. Please understand, hell is forever. But so is heaven. And you can enter heaven only through Jesus. So please turn from your sins. Trust in Jesus' sacrifice for sins. His blood shed on the cross. His body given on the cross alone can bring full pardon for all your sins. Surrender your life to him. Surrender your life. You will not only receive a new heart, but more importantly, you will receive the experience of the inward presence of the Holy Spirit who will never leave you. He will guide you. He will empower you to live for God and to serve him and others faithfully. He will bring you into heaven for sure. The journey might be rocky, but the destination is certain. Jesus will take us safely. So come to Jesus in repentance and in faith, pleading with him, Lord, have mercy on me. You can do that from where you are sitting, but it must be from your heart. So please come to Christ. Have all your sins washed away in his blood. Have new life. Have new life. Experience the joy of God living inside of you. Let's pray. Lord, my words cannot bring any change. I trust in your spirit to accomplish the purpose for which you have brought us together as we humble ourselves under your word. Please, Lord, let us not be stiff-necked and resist you in any way, but let us, let us come. And for those who are far away, please, 
enable them to come to you in repentance and faith so that they could also be on that journey to eternity. Thank you, dear Lord, for helping us to journey through this fantastic book. Help us to appreciate this book with a new sense. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy. In your lovely name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.